phone. Don't need no speed, it gotta give me home. And welcome to Simple Life Stories for the Adventurous at Heart, sponsored in part by Pilgrim's Way Community Bookstore and Secret Garden. I want to say a big shout out to everyone at Pilgrim's Way right now. I get all choked up. Uh, thank you, Paul, for holding down the fort there. I am your host, Cynthia Fernandez. I have a bit of a cold. So I um, will do my best to hang on to my voice through this hour. I thought I would uh, start with some book notes. You know, I had uh, a few people asking before the show began if we were going to have book reviews since we're in part sponsored by a bookstore. And the answer was, of course. So one of the ones that popped to the top was Proof of Heaven. Uh, If you haven't heard it on Oprah, read about it on Huffington Post, it's been on, I don't know, any number of media outlets. Um, It has uh, actually, for our experience in the bookstore, it's it's, uh, sold out and uh, a couple of times because people were rushing in so quickly. And then we found out the publisher had sold out and it had to quickly be reprinted. It's only been published since October of last year. But let me tell you a little bit about this book, if you don't already know. So the title is Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, author Eben Alexander. One of the interesting aspects of this is that uh, this particular author is not only a um, neurosurgeon, he is on the American Board of Neurological neurological surgery and American College of Surgeons Um, studied through Duke University back in the 80s now the other aspect that I really found fascinating was that um, he describes himself as having a Christian background but admittedly did not have much faith in the afterlife or a personal God he was a scientist and uh, through education experience believed that man would eventually discover how the brain formed consciousness and created thought and faith however he contracted e coli bacterial meningitis so rare a disease that only one in 10 million of the world's population contracts it annually and of those 90 percent die quickly and the remaining require round-the-clock care for the rest of their lives now dr alexander remained in brain dead coma for seven days but when his doctors were considering stopping treatment his eyes opened and he slowly recovered and when he recovered this was back in 2008 he um, he asserts that his brain far from being dead although that was the technical consensus in the medical field Uh, that he had never been feeling he had never been so alive and that he in fact enjoyed a glimpse of the afterlife that he know he now knows not just faith that the universe is a place of love and that we are immortal so another interesting thing about this book is that his writing style he alternates chapters in his book between his experiences in the coma with what was happening in the real world and um, I I happen to know uh, some people in the area Uh, one person in particular uh, thought of this book as a gift for a family member who just lost a spouse this family member um, happens to also be in the medical field so yeah it's it's a really interesting story um you know it's interesting to me too that we have a rash of this topic going on in the marketplace i mean heaven and back anita morjani who just recently visited her book is titled dying to be me um proof of heaven of course I just mentioned heaven is real it's um I, i'm not sure what the meaning of all that is but i am noticing the pattern so um another uh, couple of things i want to mention not in print yet but also uh interesting to mention are um uh what we call front list so they're soon to be published they're going to be published january 29th um this year one of them 
for all you creative writers out there is titled why rewrite 20 acclaimed authors on how and why they do what they do and this author has compiled um, a collection of interviews with well-known writers that you know she's been able to interview and find out their inside story their sort of tricks of the trade their secrets etc I'll just mention a few of them uh, Jennifer Egan, James Frey, Sarah Gruen, Terry McMillan, uh, Jody Piquot, um, to name a few. So that, as I say, is coming out at the end of January. And just had to mention very quickly, uh, does anyone remember when Star Trek came out in the 60s? I think it, it debuted in 1966. I have heard for such a long time that there are um, faithful fans, Trekkies out there who, you know, just watch everything and read everything. So for you all, there is a new book coming out, Star Trek, the original series, Allegiance in Exile. It'll be a, um, a small paperback, um, but it has a, a really interesting story possibly um yeah familiar to many of you who have watched the uss enterprise on tv for so long so um that is what i have to share with you at the moment and if we have time we will come back to some additional top sellers at the end of the hour we're going to see how this hour plays out <laughs> such individual. If you're listening, I hope you consider the possibility that the people around you, in the bus, in the office, in the grocery store, or wherever, may have a lot to say and is yet unheard. Today's guest is Frank Wilson, owner of Afterglow Computers. He's agreed to meet with me one-on-one -on -one in the recording studio for this interview, so this is uh, a portion that's been pre-recorded. Let's listen. And I want to welcome you here today and, and applaud you for your courageous uh, willingness to be heard. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We were having a conversation the other day about money, and I know that as a professional in a service industry, you know, you still are interested in making money, paying bills, but uh, you shared with me some different perspectives that, in fact, you're not part of the rat race anymore. Would you would you describe that? Um, as you say, I do need to make money just because it's one of the uh, unfortunate side effects of the system in which I live. But I strive to find a way to remove myself from the need of money and move myself into the idea that life is more than running af after profit. So more than running after profit, what, um, what kinds of things do you hold as real values in your quality of life? Um, some of the things that I've done to actually get away from uh, the game of Monopoly that we're all playing is I spent a lot of my free time just trying to discover the past, how past human beings lived before governments took over and before the society was built up to what it is today. And I see in them a freedom where they're attached to the earth in a way that seems more natural. I, see, draw, I seem drawn to the story of our ancestors migrating all over the planet 
they seem connected to that story. And when I go out on hikes or I go out on walks, um, I feel more alive than I ever do when I'm at work or doing some tedious chore where I'm making money. Um, and in my education, in my endeavors to learn about the past, I discover that the life that I'm living is a delusion. It means nothing that I've spent a majority of my life chasing after something that doesn't really exist. And I found ways to let that go, to let go of my desire for, for material things, uh, to detach myself from TV. Like I haven't had a TV uh, in 12 years. Wow. Only yeah. six for me. Yeah. And, and so and letting go of these things, uh, letting go of my desire for wealth or my desire for things and my desire to go out and buy something, you know, I just let that go. And I find that life is more satisfying because I actually find that um, through educating myself, going on walks, I have better health, I have better spirits. I'm not I'm not swamped with anxiety and depression mm. and misery. You don't strike me as a fearful person, really. Is well, that somehow related to what you're speaking what do you mean? about? Well, you know, a lot of anxiety for people is an anxiousness to get more or whatever. But another part of it is the response to maybe media or um, input about things we should be afraid of. I have to take care of myself. I would find myself like six or seven years ago waking up with really strong anxiety, scared that I'm not going to make it, and afraid because I had nobody to hold on to. And in that is where I found my strength to be able to actually pick myself up and realize that life is a lot easier than I thought. And the anxiety was always financial. Mm. Like, am I making enough money? Am I making enough money? And then it, it stemmed into the future. Will I be able to take care of myself 10 years from now? Will I have enough money 30 years from now? And it overwhelmed me every day. It just, I'd wake up sick in my stomach. I'd throw up. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd be riddled with doubts and depression. And one day I just got mad at that. I started talking to it. I told it to go away. I mean, and, and it kind of simplifies it, but I started having a conversation with those nasty feelings to find out where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. and, and opening that conversation up, I realized it stemmed from this artificial system that was imposed upon me that I was born into. And so I started letting go of these desires. Like as a kid, I, for some reason, was told I needed to make millions. I needed to be wealthy and I needed to be successful. And there was a lot of pressure there was a lot of pressure in school. You need to get straight A's. You need to, there's always a progress report. How you doing next week? How, have you, how much progress have you made today? And it was like, push, 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 push. And it would just create a, a nasty uh, slew of emotions. And so in opening that conversation, I was able to realize that it all stemmed from just junk that other people threw into my brain that confused me and separated away from what I actually am, who I am and what I should be in life. And by doing that, I've been able to slow down. I've been able to relax. My days are four times longer than they ever were. My time is more consumed with enlightenment and taking walks. I'll go for a walk and end up 10 miles down the road and realize that I still have a whole day ahead of me. And I feel great because I'm not constantly wrapped around thoughts of, should I be making more money? What's my progress? How am I progressing compared to someone else? And that constant comparison of where should I be right now? Am I doing well enough? And then just dialing it back and realizing that life isn't about all that stuff. You know, it's about taking your time, relaxing, enjoying the experience, enjoying the adventure, connecting with other people learning about the past, the truthfulness of the past, and not being wrapped up in the propaganda, the fear-mongering, the, oh my God, the crisis, the federal government's going to collapse, the financial crisis, uh, the debt ceiling, the, oh, oh, you know, and the constant wars, the constant wars. It just seems just so ridiculous to me now, and I want to walk away from it all. And I ended up finding a place in life where I see it all as like a picture show now, and I'm not part of it, but I'm witnessing it and I see it as madness as everyone speeds around me now at the speed of light. My life seems to be slowing down and becoming more peaceful. 
and I see people just zipping by me without even noticing that moment they just missed or being wrapped up in that, that anxiety or that war or that, you know, that hate, hateful conversation that people are having today that just separate us away from who we truly are. You're listening to The Simple Life, stories for the adventurous at heart, and our guest today is Frank Wilson, owner of Afterglow Computers. Now, you mentioned enlightenment a moment ago, and I'm, I'm wondering to myself if what you're describing your perception to be isn't, in fact, enlightenment. Are you, do you consider yourself a religious person or a spiritual person? Um, to be honest, um, not really. I, I've spent a lot of time studying mythologies, religions. I understand uh, e even where um, the basic concepts of all religions comes from. And it stems from when we as a people, many, many thousands of years ago, were really connected to the earth and our divinity. That means something to me. That story means a lot to me because when I go out in nature, I touch the earth, I feel connected to it, and I, it may seem, seem bizarre, but I actually feel revitalized, and I feel the energy of life around me when I'm in the woods. But on the same thought, I think to myself that's kind of silly because in the rational mind, I want to reject any kind of magical thing in life and say, well, there's no, there's no real rational reason why, so it doesn't exist. I so I, I don't subscribe to a religion, I don't subscribe to some other person's version of what they think religion is, but I do subscribe to what we were as a people before writing. Before writing was invented, we were really connected to the earth. We were part of the earth. Um, and after that, it was warped and twisted and then changed for those in power to use against the population. And, and it just started us down that road of separation from what we were. There's an interesting site in Turkey called uh, Gobekli Tepe they just discovered, and it's dated back to 9000 BCE. Um, they say it's actually 7,000 years older than the pyramids, and we were taught in school that civilization started with Africa and the Egyptians and the Sumerians and Mesopotamia, but that's not even the truth. We have a story that goes back 7,000 years before that that we're just now discovering, and it was a religious site. They say it was a religious site. It wasn't a living site. It was where communities of hunter-gatherers gathered to commune with their gods or their, their nature or whatever it was. I mean, it was so long ago that we, we can't even begin to grasp what it was they were connected to. But the site was like 19 feet tall stones. They didn't even have metal tools. And there's carvings using negative space so that the carvings actually stick mm -hmm. out from the rock. And it was very advanced for 12,000 years ago. And so there's that story of what we were 12,000 years ago between that and when the pyramids were built, we're missing that. And I feel that that's where we will find the truth of like the actual connection that we have to this planet, to who we are. Because after that, when writing was invented, then the story started to get warped and twisted and changed and you know plagiarized and rewritten and reworded and to the point where it's so convoluted it doesn't make any sense our guest today on the simple life frank wilson with afterglow computers so so this ancient site was um uh, uncovered in turkey and uh, uh i know you said it was dated as nine thousand years bce um and and is there some question about that? Is it nine thousand to twelve thousand? Oh well, they you know the the method, methods they used to date are pretty reliable. Um, they found that the people who used it buried it up and had a um, multitude of bones, uh, animal bones that were brought to the site, antelope and whatnot. That's easy to date. Uh, we know these methods work, and so they they suspect that the site was even used earlier than that because it took time to build, and they're they're they've only uncovered about five percent of it, wow. and they're speculating that the part that they haven't uncovered even dates back to just right after the last ice age, Interesting. which would put it about 14,000 years ago. And so how is this site uncovered? How is it found? Uh, some farmer was annoyed that he had this rock sticking out of his dirt. <laughs> 
and he didn't know what it was. He, he dug down, and I guess he realized it wasn't just a rock. And someone else came along. You know, forgive me, I don't remember their names, but someone else came along and thought they were grave markers from other, some other civilization. But when he started digging, he realized it was from the Neolithic age that these were actual stone monuments like that predated anything else on this planet by thousands of years. Mm. The pyramids were supposedly the oldest structure on Earth. I mean, even the uh, Stonehenge is ancient, but this predates all of those sites by thousands, 7,000 to 9,000 years. That's amazing. And this was before the invention of pottery, before the invention of writing, before the invention of metallurgy. There was no copper bronze tools. You know, they, they made this site with other rocks. Other rocks. Yeah. They made this using rocks as tools against softer stones. Yes. Lime, they limestone. limestone. It's all limestone. And it's, uh, it's fascinating because these blocks weigh tons. Mm. Like, I think up to, and I could be wrong on this, but like up to 16 tons a block. Wow. And, and they show a method of like how they row the blocks with sticks. Oh but, but the fact is, is this just blows away any concept we have. And, and, and what it tells me is the civilizations that we have today who are telling us the story of how the world was put together are basically robbing us of our cultural heritage of who we really are. Because life didn't start with Egypt. Mm-hmm. And it shows that this site, that we as a people came together for religious reasons, for no other reason, we came together for religious reasons before any city, before writing, before any invention. And we were building monolithic, huge structures to tie ourselves to that divinity of who we were, to the earth. To and you, you draw real... Uh insight from that real perspective somehow i i do because the story uh reunites me with what and who i am and what it means to be a human being we're not here to live you know we're the only animals on the planet that have to pay to live here (laughs) that's true and, and 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 i actually believed that our ancestors back then had better lives than we do how so their freedom their lives, their daily lives, weren't about this turmoil and struggle, 40-hour week, uh, work week, you know, minimum wage jobs. They, they woke up in the morning and they got to live life. They took care of their animals or, you know, the hunter group went off and hunted. But when they, when they hunted their food and they had a couple kills, that was enough food to feed the tribe for weeks. So, so they're not hunting every day, all day, every hour of the day. Today they go hunting, they kill something large, they bring it back, and they spend all their time feasting, dancing, celebrating, and and worshiping whatever god they worship, reconnecting with the earth and just living. Their life isn't about pressuring yourself to continually progress progress in life so that you, you accumulate more stuff. They lived. They were at one with the earth. They connected with what they were. They were free. This is fascinating. If you're just uh, joining us, stay with us. We're going to continue talking to Frank Wilson, owner of Afterglow Computers, as soon as we get back from this break. me about you in particular is that you survived an injury that was told to you was going to keep you in a wheelchair and it didn't oh you know it i (laughs) I, um i actually forgot about that (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah back in october i think it was 2008 i forget maybe seven eight seven 2007 okay um yeah, I fell off a two-story building, and I crushed both my ankles. Um, about a 20-foot fall, and pri- primarily I, I fell on the right heel, and it completely obliterated my ankle. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you the x-rays on, on, uh, on the show, but um, in my left ankle, I ended up with seven screws, and it kind of fully healed, and it feels great. It feels back to normal 100%, but the right ankle was obliterated. And they told me I'd never be able to walk again. And um, 
it took about three months for all the surgeries to go through from October, November, December, oh, two months. So I had like three major surgeries and in my right ankle, I ended up with a plate on each side that goes up about halfway from my shin down to my, to my heel. And I have about 27 screws holding it all together. And there's very little motion in there. And when I first went to the hospital, there was a doctor there who just absolutely wanted to make sure that I would know that I would never walk again. He'd come in every day and say, you know, this is horrible. You're never going to walk again. And he said it in such a way that he, he sounded miserable. And, and one day he said to me, you know, you'll be lucky if you'll be able to get up and move from the living room to your bathroom. Oh, my God. And what I did in that moment in time is I smiled at him and I imagined my apartment's in Salinas and I imagined a porta potty in Carmel <laughs> in my head and thought, I'll be able to walk to the bathroom thinking that, you know, I put the distance between my living room and the bathroom 20, 30 miles apart. And that's how I thought of it instantly when he wow. said, you won't be able to walk to your bathroom. All of a sudden in my head, I pictured my bathroom 40 miles away and thought, okay, 40 miles, it's pushing it. But it really came down to um, the last time I went to the doctor, the good one that actually fixed me up in Santa Clara, I walked in. It was three months after my surgeries. Oh my I had gone out to Big Sur and done a three mile hike and pushed myself like a crazy man, I guess. But um, I hiked the hills. I hiked all the way up in the mountains of Big Sur, and I ended up going to that doctor, and she um, handed me a slip of paper that day, and I asked her what that was for, and she said, that's, that's so that you can do rehab and they can teach you how to walk again. <laughs> and I said, well, didn't you realize I didn't come with a wheelchair? And, and she was blown away, and so, so much so that... Um, I mean, we're talking about a couple months, three months after all these major surgeries. I, I stopped the painkillers the day after my surgery because they were blocking my brain. You know, in fact, after I got off the painkillers the next day, after that last major surgery where they were putting metal in there, when my brain was cleared of the morphine, all of my pain dropped to zero. Oh, my gosh. I felt reconnected to my body. I felt good. I had a really positive attitude. You know, I just believed it was a scratch and that the painkillers were actually increasing the pain, and they were. Once I had my mind cleared and I reconnected with myself, it made it real easy to fix it. Just push myself past this, like, oh, it's nothing. You know, I think the day I met you was the first day you took a client. That was the first day you drove yourself anywhere. And you walked to the front door and you said, this is the first day that I'm back to work. Yeah, actually, uh, I think about three months I was having people come over and uh, I was doing work out of my apartment and I actually had my grandmother helping me. Um, she was, she stood in there for me and it was nice. But um, um, yeah, it took me a while to get back in the car and drive again. I was told I couldn't drive, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do all this stuff. But um, after that hike, after seeing the doctor, she recorded me walking down the hallway. She was so blown away. She watched me walking down the hallway, recorded it. And she told me she was sending it off to Stanford Medical for the students. Awesome. So they could see the injury, the repair, and like three months later, me walking. That's incredible. And uh, to this day, uh, I am not limited in any way because I don't, I don't believe I'm a victim. And I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to my injury as an identity or an identifying property of me. Like, oh, poor me. I have this thing that I am. So it, it goes away. You know, in fact, on Sunday, I went out to Big Sur and I did some crazy um, rock climbing out in Big Sur. I went down one of the cliffs you're not supposed to go down, and it took me two hours climbing up vertical faces uh, through oh some of the God. craziest terrain um, that I don't think anybody in their rational mind would do. But I was out there rock climbing freestyle, no gear, using roots and whatnot, climbing up vertical faces because I put myself in a situation that could be deemed dangerous, you know? Um, my survival mechanism kicked in and I'm like, oh, I have to live. I have to get out of this. I was trapped. Like there, The only way I could have gotten out was the struggle of climbing up this rock face and in the bush that I did or, you know, uh, calling for a helicopter. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it's nice because uh, I, I, even after all these years of that injury and told I wasn't gonna walk again, I'm out in nature 
connecting with earth, feeling alive and able to do things that most healthy people can't do. So there again, you didn't take <clears throat> someone else's word for what was true. Yeah, because it's not my truth. Exactly. It's, it's what he wants to believe. He, it's what he wants me to believe. Or maybe it's what he believes. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in that negative thought, um, you know, maybe that's how he just thinks that everything's going to be. And he, he tells this to his patients. And, it, and in that aspect, it could be uh, detrimental because there might be all these patients to subscribe to the doctor knows best. And yeah, I'll, doctor says, I'll never be able to walk again. Poor me. I'm just going to be in my wheelchair collecting my disability. And on that note, do you know what I took for disability? No. Nothing. I took the little blue thing that you can hang in your car so that I can get closer parking <laughs> sometimes if I wanted to. Uh -huh. And I don't even use it all the time. In fact, there are times when I go to the grocery store and I park far away from the door to force myself to walk to the door. And, and so even in taking that, I didn't take any disability money or anything like that. And even in taking that, I don't abuse it or even think that I need it. Um, I just got it. And I thought, oh, okay, whatever. It's an option. And, and so that just kind of goes to the whole mindset that I have about this. My injury isn't me. It's something that happened to me. And in fact, I forgot about it till you brought it up. You know, sometimes my ankle's sore, but I don't even think about like, oh yeah, I broke my ankles. It's just like a an ache or pain that you might have like in your back or, ooh, my wrist kind of aches today. You don't think about some injury. You know, I don't identify to some injury. I just identify to, oh, my body's a little achy. And then I just move on. Um, whereas I could see how some people would, you know, subscribe to the idea that they're broken and they can't do anything. The doctor says I'll never walk again and they don't even try. In fact, I started my own recovery against everybody's best wishes against me. They, the doctor told me not to stand up. My mom told me not to stand up. Um, person I was with at the time told me I shouldn't be standing up. So when I was left alone by myself, <laughs> I started standing up. <laughs> And that's why everyone was blown away because they, they believed I needed to recover some certain way. Whereas I knew within myself, I didn't need the drugs. And what I need to do is get back on my feet and I need to start walking again. Mm. And I would walk and I would walk. It would hurt. Like I said, I did that three mile hike through the mountains of Big Sur. It took me three or four days to recover from that, oh, wow. to be able to walk again after that because I worked the muscles and I worked the ankles so much that once it built up after that, I was just building strength and building myself back up to the mm. point now I can do little jogs. Whoa. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, literally and figuratively, you've been standing up for yourself your whole life. Yeah. 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 Well, I really appreciate your time today. It's been fabulous talking with you. I'm so grateful to know someone like you. And I hope that our listeners are as inspired as I am. So thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you for the opportunity for me to share my story. Um, in fact, um, a lot of what I had to say today, um, I never really shared with any audience other than one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with people like you who, um, who are open to the idea, you know, to that conversation, you know, in my business and, and meeting all the people that I do. Uh, I tell you about 99% of them are wrapped up in the misery of their life and are not receptive to any new knowledge or any of that um, experience that I have to share. And so a lot of the time I don't have an opportunity to be able to, to share that experience. And a lot of time I'm alone in my own little world because mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by people who are still trapped in their little lives and have no idea where I'm even coming from. Mm. So I really do appreciate this opportunity today. And thank you. Thank you. So that was our, our interview with Frank Wilson, owner of Afterglow Computers. If anybody wants a very zen computer guy, that's the one I would send you to. I have um, a little bit of an uh, event to announce here. I wanted to promote and, and just make sure everybody knows about our own local lovely illustrator, Erin Hunter. She has authored, um, well, I should say illustrated, three children's books that she will be presenting at the Stevenson School on February 5th. 
And um, I want to make sure parents know that if you have one of those kids attending Stevenson School, that you can um, definitely pop into Pilgrim's Way Community Bookstore in Secret Garden for your copy, your signed copy. And if you have trouble with parking, we are always happy to run it out to you. Just give us a call. Uh, 831-624-4955 is the number. So the three books, I'm going to give you titles. Uh, The first one listed here, A Day on the Mountain. It's a great story about what you would encounter outdoors on a mountainside, the animals and the insects, and uh, it's just uh, wonderfully illustrated. She, She has artistic training and a love of the natural world, so the two of those together work really well for her. Um, The second title, Multiply on the Fly, is a book about multiplication for kids. Really catchy lyrics. um, I shouldn't say lyrics, but, you know, vernacular. And in, in sort of the same genre, the last of the three listed is The Great Divide, all about division on the same order. So um, what I'd like to do is play for you an interview with Erin Hunter when she was uh, interviewed on TV last fall. So stay with us. Uh, I'm having a little technical difficulty. All right, here we go. Welcome back. We feature a lot of authors here on Low Country Live, and today we get to talk to a, someone who is often the one to make the pages come alive. Aaron Hunter is a children's book illustrator. Great to see you, Aaron. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, how does one get to be a children's book illustrator? Um, well, you can study art in school. You can study illustration. I was a graphic designer before I became an illustrator, and uh, after working as a designer for a few years, I went back to school and did the science illustration program. Uh, it used to be at UC Santa Cruz, and now it's at Cal State Monterey Bay in okay. California. And um, that. Okay, so we got interrupted with our interview with Aaron Hunter, and I'm not sure which, Welcome but... Welcome back. We feature a lot of authors here on Low Country Live, and today we get to talk to a, someone who is often the one to make the page... I'm going to try to figure out in the background while I'm speaking to you uh, what exactly we are um, experiencing. Which one? I was a graphic designer before I became an illustrator, and uh, after working as a designer for a few years, I went back to school and did the science illustration program. Uh, It used to be at UC Santa Cruz, and now it's at Cal State Monterey Bay in California, and um, that set me up to have a career doing children's books, among other things. Now, a lot of times, I know for me, I'm I'm a scientist, but it's hard for me to grasp the arts. How is Mm -hmm. it for an artist to grasp the sciences? Yeah, that was a concern for me at first without having a science background, but um, a lot of the people who come into the science illustration program are coming from a science background, and so um, they were very helpful um, helping me learn all the terminology that I didn't know. Sure. Um, and I was able to give them uh, you know, some help on things like uh, layout and color and things like that. So um, they were a great help to me, and then you just learn as you go. So it's really just a great partnership that you have there. Yes, it's really wonderful. And you've been working with the local publishing company, Sylvandell Publishing, mm-hmm. and you've, you've put out some books. What, what's your latest book, this one here? Mm-hmm. The latest one is The Great Divide. It was written by uh, Suzanne Slade. And um, it, that was a, a really fun book to work on. Um, it teaches math concepts. It also talks about um, collective nouns so that uh, people reading the book get to learn about, um, you know, some, some uh, division skills, some math sure. skills, but also the names for different groups of animals. And th- there are all kinds of different animals in here. Frogs, mm-hmm. I see chimpanzees, uh, kangaroos, mm-hmm. ducks. Everything is in here. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you do your artwork? Are these paintings? Mm-hmm. These are all acrylic paintings. They're slightly larger than uh, the originals are slightly larger than they appear in the book. 
And um, I get a manuscript from my editor, Donna German, um, at Solvendel. And what she'll do is send me a manuscript, and she's already blocked everything out. So I'll go through the manuscript and figure out page by page what she's interested in. I start by sending her some rough sketches um, after doing some research. We go back and forth, and once she's approved the sketches, I um, transfer them to watercolor paper and start painting. Now, how long does the actual painting take once, once you've got the okay to go ahead and, and paint it? Um, it depends. Some of them take longer than others. You can tell which ones are more complicated than the others. Um, I would say, oh gosh, I work on them uh, a couple hours every day for uh, two weeks or so. In, in the detail, like this is one of your other books, mm -hmm. Multiply on the Fly, the detail on these bees. Mm. Well, I had specimens for most of the uh, insects in this book, which I borrowed from a local middle school teacher. Um, he has his students collect insects every year, and, and he lent me a bunch of specimens, which had very charming little labels written by, by sixth grade students. Oh, cool. So I had the specimens right in front of me, and that's how I was able to get all of that detail. Really beautiful. And, and if folks do want these books for their kids, how are they available? Um, they're available. You can certainly go to your bookstore and ask them to order these books for you. You mm -hmm. can find them on Amazon or at Sylvan Dell's website, which is sylvandellpublishing.com. Sounds great. And I so that's our lovely Erin Hunter. We are going to go to a break now. Please stay with us. We have a, uh, a child's uh, rendition of a children's story to be read to you. So stay with us. And we're back. Well, we're having a little trouble with Bella's story, so um, we're going to try to get that up for you. It was so adorable. I just love kids in books, you can imagine. Um, all right, let's see. I'm your host for A Simple Life. My name is Cynthia Fernandez, and I'm joined here in the studio with Miss Isabella Ball. Hi, Isabella. Hi. So I invited you on to um, read a story. It's story time. Which story have you chosen for us tonight? The title of the book is Swirl by Swirl, Spirals in Nature by Joyce Sidman. Pictures by Beth Crumbs, winner of the Caldecott Medal for The House in the Night. Great. I can't wait. And this, this is the story. What makes a tiny snail shell so beautiful? Why does the shape why does that shape occur in nature? What it over and over again in rushing rivers, in a flower bud, even inside your ear. Spirals, bold, beautiful, and mysterious, are all around us. Can you find one? A spiral is a snuggling shape. It fits neatly in small places. Coiled tight, warm, safe and see if it waits for a chance to expand. A spiral is a growing shape. It starts small and gets bigger, bigger, and bigger. Swirl by swirl. It unwraps itself one soft curl at a time, just like a lady fern. A spiral is a strong shape. Its outer curves protect what's inside. It knows how to defend itself, like a merino sheet. A spiral reaches out, too. Exploring the world, it winds around and around and around and clings tight grasping what it needs only. It never has trouble holding on, just like a spider monkey. A spiral is a clever shape. It's graceful and strong, like a garden orb spider. It is bold, like breaking ocean waves, and beautiful, like a daisy, a rose, a chrysanthemum, angel like an angel's trumpet, calla lily, hibiscus, sunflower, gardenia, all other kinds of flowers too. A spiral moves. It swirls through water gathering bubbles like a tidal whirlpool. It twists through air with clouds on its tail like a classic funnel tornado. It stretches its starry arms through space, spinning and sparkling forever like a spiral galaxy. Or it curls up neat and small, warm and safe. A spiral is a snuggling shape. The end. Thank you, Bella. That was great. So we did, after all, get Bella on the uh, on the program. Thanks to Michelle Jackson, <laughs> saving the day. 
Oh, goodness. Okay, so that book has been um, really popular in the store. It is a book all about the Fibonacci spiral and shows lots of beautiful illustrations in nature where you can find the spiral. And um, we just, uh, you know, lucked out getting Bella to read it. I don't know if you could hear, but about midway through, she was starting to add the description of each of pages of illustration into her story just to you know spice it up a bit so we're nearing the end of the hour um i just uh, have a few minutes left i am going to throw in some of the best sellers that we talked about when i started uh, speaking today now just to give you a frame of reference uh, this list of best sellers comes from the northern california indie best sellers list and uh, so that's a, a composite, a surveying, if you will, of all the independent bookstores in Northern California. And uh, we have them broken down into categories. So for hardcover fiction, some of them on the top 10 list include Gone Girl, which is described as a nerve fraying thriller that confounds readers as they go. Um, it's done really well in the store. The Roundhouse is written by a Native American uh, author who apparently writes uh, a number of a number of stories uh, most credited for a previous one titled The Plague of Doves. The author's name is Lu uh, Louise Erdick. Sorry, I didn't mention Gone Girl's author. Jillian Flynn was Gone Girl's author. And so now we're speaking about The Roundhouse. Uh, the author returns to her... Um, uh, Pulitzer Prize talent and she writes um, about the transports of Ojibwe reservation in, in North Dakota so the life of living on the reservation there um, the other one that I made a note of was uh, titled Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore by Robin Sloan this is a, a novel set, um, mostly set in a bookstore in San Francisco, and it's about conspiracy and complex code breaking and the like. So that looked really interesting. Uh, on the hardcover nonfiction list, we're going to continue that for um, next week, and I will fill in with the... Uh, uh, hardcover nonfiction and trade paperback and so on but come on in we have a really nice section in the front of the store for all of our new release books and we'd love to see you Pilgrim's Way between 5th and 6th on Dolores in Carmel by the sea check us out until then what's your story keep it simple Zabadab, 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 zabadab